Call all hands. Beat to quarters. Run out the gun. Stand by this tower battery. One broadside into it, if you please, Captain Bush. Pointers on target. Linstock's ready. Aye, aye, sir. Ready. Fire! <laughs> Presenting Michael Redgrave as C.S. Forrester's Indomitable Man of the Sea, Horatio Hornblower. transcribed the story of the fabulous Horatio Hornblower, wedded since early youth to Britain's ships and Britain's destiny at sea, adventuring across the seven oceans as midshipman, as lieutenant, as captain of the line, Hornblower has seen the threatening shadow of Napoleon Bonaparte fall on half the world, has himself even been Napoleon's prisoner of war in France. But now, respite has come, home again in England, laden with honors, Relieved from duty by his king, ex-Captain Hornblower can relax at last. The year is 1812. When you've been many years at sea, it sometimes seems a little difficult, uh, I might even say arduous, to live ashore. Especially when your lovely wife, your adored recent bride, rather expects you to become a country gentleman. Well, life is made up of change, they say, but... For an old sea dog, new tricks come harder than for other breeds, I think. Well, there I was, not long returned from confinement in France as the unwelcome guest of Bonaparte, granted a knighthood, happily married to my enchanting Lady Barbara, free of all financial cares at last, and yet... And yet, oh, yes, I knew it for my fault, but somehow, there in the quiet English countryside, I hadn't quite come home. As yet. Ooh, ooh, more bath water, sir? Oh, heaven forbid. It's mostly on the deck, the, the floor already, isn't it? Ah, oh, tin tub the size of a teapot. A fine way for a grown man to bathe himself. Yeah, all right, I've had enough. Give me that towel, Brown. Don't slip, sir. What a ridiculous contrivances. Give me a wash deck pump and gallons of cold seawater. Remember, Brown? Oh, I remember, sir Horatio. Yes, belay that, sir Horatio. Old terms are good enough, aren't they, you idiot? Yes, sir. It's a lovely morning, sir. Is it? Oh, yes, yes, I suppose so. <clears throat> still and quiet. It's very quiet. It's queer. When I wake here, I still keep listening for the sounds, rattle of blocks, the cordage wheezing, and... Oh, well, never mind. I've laid out your new suit, sir. What do you mean, that tight buff-coloured thing? It's a beautiful suit, sir, I think. Oh, do you? Tight trousers... Fancy coat, flowered waistcoat, and a stock. Oh, I'll never draw an easy breath in that confounded choker. Oh, well, let's get it on. Mustn't keep Lady Barbara waiting downstairs for her breakfast. Welcome to the new squire of Smallbridge. Now, oh, you're laughing at me. You know perfectly well, Barbara, how I felt about that insufferable ceremony yesterday. So, squire, indeed. Oh, oh, I do know, my dear, and you were sweet. Suffering it all without complaint. Mm -hmm. Only the faintest glare of defiance now and then during the speech making. <laughs> Coffee, dear? Thank you. Well, what do we have planned today? I thought that you and I might drive across the Downs this morning. Uh huh. Of course, you said you had a lot of reading you'd been putting off. Gibbon, well, was it? Well, yes. I, uh, yes, I do want to get at that. It's, um, <clears throat> yes, quite soon, in fact. A letter for you, Sir Horatio. Oh, oh thank you, Wiggins. The messenger is waiting, my lord. He is from the Admiralty in London. The Admiralty? The Admiralty? Eh? 
Darling, it... It couldn't be... Here, yeah, listen to this. The Lord's Commissioners request that I present myself at once. A, a matter of extreme importance which cannot even be discussed except in... Uh, hey, Wiggins, where's Brown? Tell him to get out my best uniform and sword. Tell him to pack my things for the night. And look, tell him that... You're I... going to London right away? Well, my love, the letter says at once. Remember, we're still at war with Bonaparte. Now, off with you, Wiggins. Uh, tell Brown I'll be upstairs immediately. And I want him to drive me. We we'll take the chariot. I wished I didn't need to look at her just then. After the first surprise, she would try so hard to appear calm and, and pleased that I was pleased. I, I hadn't been quite frank with her, perhaps. To be exact, the letter asked whether or not I would accept a new appointment. I, I didn't know what to say to Barbara, but... Oh, my dear, it's merely for the night. I'll be back in the morning, um, whatever this amounts to. Yes, for a day or so, perhaps. Oh, just look at you, brazen child. Excited as a midshipman. Oh. It's breaking over you in waves. Do you suppose I don't see it? Oh, my dear, when, well, when the Admiralty itself, I, 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 well, I must at least find out. I know what you'll find out. Wild horses couldn't hold you now, of course. Do you know how long we've lived here at Smallbridge? Why, I... Two months. Two months tomorrow, I... <laughs> oh, dearest, I've always known. Retirement simply isn't in your line. It's a great honor to be recalled so soon. You must be pleased. And I am too. If they, um, if they appointed me a, a, a Commodore, well, they might, you know. Well, well, if they did, I, I might have to go back to sea again. Darling, we've been married six whole months. A wonderful half year. I've had that much of happiness with you. And whatever happens, you'll come back to me. I know you will. Of course I will. Oh, Barbara, Barbara, I swear you, you're a woman in 10,000. She was, you know. In all my life, I'd said no truer word than that, I told myself as we drove up to London. Well, we made excellent time. Brown knew his business with horses. I never understood the peculiar beasts. Uh, Brown was good at everything. Best captain's coxswain in the Navy, and, and now the perfect manservant. Still, I rather thought he mightn't mind going back to sea again. There was a queer look in his eye, especially when we drew up before the Admiralty in Whitehall and I was ushered in to the First Lord. Sit down, sit down, Captain Horatio. Well, you, well. Left your newfound domestic bliss behind, eh, when uh -huh. you received our letter? Well, may I ask what it is you have in mind for me, sir? Of course you may. The Baltic, Horatio. The Baltic? But is Russia coming into the war, then? Who knows? I wish I did. That very question's at the heart of this whole project. Uh, Our letter did say, didn't it, that you'd take rank as Commodore yes. with a captain under you. You'd have six ships. The Nonsuch, 74, a ship of force. The Nonsuch? Oh, I know her well, sir. Both the Russian Tsar and Prince Bernadotte of Sweden have teetered back and forth for months, you know. Well, from all I've heard, Boney's making tempting offers to them both. And Bernadotte's a Frenchman, after all. Uh, is there really any chance that they might join us, sir? They might, if we handle them sensibly. They have as much fear as we, now Boney's gobbled up most of the continent. The die will be cast any day, we think. Uh -huh. If we can show those Baltic powers some British naval strength to count on. I understand, sir. At any rate, we've got to keep the Baltic open for supplies. Mm -hmm. So much that we need here comes by those sea lanes. Well, are you ready? Is it settled? Yes, it's settled. Good. Now tell me, who would you like for captain of the nuns, uh, John, do you? I'd like to have Bush, sir, if he's available. I'd hate to go to sea without old Bush. I rather thought you'd ask for him. That wooden leg of his won't be a handicap, you think? Oh, I think not, sir. You two have seen some things together, haven't you? First met as young lieutenants on the old renown. That's right, sir. Well, then, Bush it shall be. Now, then, let's walk across and see the Foreign Secretary. He's sure to have some secret orders for you. Time had come to say goodbye to Barbara. She drove with me from Smallbridge to Deal Jetty. The Nunsuch and the five others of my pretty new squadron lay far offshore, half lost in morning mist. Brown was looking much too pleased. I had to take him down a little. Uh, stop mooning at those mastheads, Brown. Go hire a lugger man to take us out. Step lively, now. Yes, Captain. Commodore, that is. Aye, aye, sir. Wind's veering norad a little. 
West by North now, I think. Yes, dear. So you remarked as we were driving. I beg your pardon, dear. You were telling me about my shirts. I interrupted you. <laughs> no, I'd finished with the shirts. What I was saying was that all your cold weather things are in the flat sea chest. Mm -hmm. The sheepskin coat and heavy socks and mittens and... Oh, well, Brown understands. He also has in his care a certain little package. A surprise. Surprise, my dear? Oh, no, after all, I wouldn't try to surprise you. It's just a woolen neck scarf I'd be knitting for you. Oh. It's likely to be cold up in the Baltic, even now. Yes, I don't like cold. You're, you're very thoughtful, Oh, dear. I hope... I do hope so much that you'll be back before the winter. Oh, so do I. <clears throat> I... I love you, Barbara. Boatman's alongside, sir, if you're ready. Yes, Brown. Well, now, my dear, we're... Well, you're going out by the ordinary lugger. I, I could come, too. He could bring me no, back. No, no, that would be foolish. Look at that choppy sea. It'd be quite wet and cold. I wouldn't mind. Well, I may even be seasick in that nutshell. Sometimes I am, you know, just at the start. I, I shouldn't like you to have you witness my uh, capitulation. <laughs> oh, my dear girl... I've been such a fool. It, it, it's all my fault. I, I see it now. What, what have I done to our our sweet life together? I, I needn't oh, have taken shush. this. Just think of the high compliment you're paid by this command. Oh, your ships are beautiful. Yes, but dearest, to, to leave you now. I'd, oh, I was much too proud, much too impulsive. I, I, I should have told them that I... <laughs> well... And stayed at home. You, darling. Oh, don't be absurd. Brown's in the boat with all your gear. They're waiting. You must go. Think of me, Barbara. Oh, need you ask that? You'll write me everything? Mm. Everything, yes, won't you? Yes, yes. The bad things, too. Of course. Well, goodbye, Barbara. Goodbye. Come back to me. Come back to me. <laughs> touched me that she should say that. Come back to me. <laughs> like any witless wife of any common seaman. <laughs> As if by some power of my own I could control French cannon shot. <laughs> but it made me love her all the more. It made my heart ache too. That she should say such foolish things for all her pride and elegance. A little lugger pitched and rolled. A long trip all alone out to my ship. Oh, I could have let her come along. It would have done no harm. They'd seen me from the Nonsuch as we came tossing up the wind and laid into the big two-deckers, Lee. My old friend Bush, as captain, had turned the whole crew out, full dress, and I was piped aboard with all the honours of a Commodore. The ship and every man aboard was in a state of polish. Bright brass work, six side boys in white gloves, the whole Marine Guard and their band... A double lane of bosun's mates with pipes. <laughs> a childish display, perhaps some say it is, but, well, it has its, uh, <clears throat> well, exhilaration somehow. There was old Bush on the quarterdeck, surrounded by his officers, and all saluting stiffly. I had to check myself or I might actually have beamed. <laughs> that would have been ruinous to discipline, so naturally I just stalked up the line and at salute. Morning, Captain Bush. Good morning, sir. Welcome aboard. Oh, sometime since we've met, Captain Bush. Bush was stiff and correct, but his craggy face kept softening up at me as if he wanted me to laugh. This made it very difficult, of course, before the men. You'll note, sir, that your pennant's going up. I... Commodore's flag to designate your ship in the flotilla. Oh, uh, indeed. Well, <clears throat> well, Captain Bush, we shall get underway at once, if you don't mind. No time to lose. Be good enough to signal the others of the squadron. Aye, aye, sir. Very good. We sail on secret orders. I'll apprise you of their nature, Captain Bush, if you'll kindly dine with me this afternoon. You old sea urchin. <coughs> I, um, I shall be there, sir. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Adams, pass the word to our five other ships. Underway at once and keep formation. Aye, aye, sir. Underway. Anything wrong, sir? Not Bush. Oh, I see you scowling off to starboard, sir. Uh, may I find your glass? No. Is it the sloops? No, 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 no. It's nothing, Bush. <clears throat> no, I was just trying to make out the jetty. My wife's there. Hmm. Well, mist hasn't quite cleared yet, has it? In a moment, 
Michael Redgrave returns as Horatio Hornblower. And now, continuing our story, Michael Redgrave as Horatio Hornblower awaits his old friend, Captain Bush, in his Commodore's cabin aboard the flagship Nonsuch. Come in. Oh, Brown. Captain Bush will be dining with me here. Be sure the things come up hot from the galley, will you? Of course, sir. I finished your unpacking. I trust it's satisfactory, sir. I um, placed the gift from Lady Barbara there on the um, bulkhead shelf. Yes, I, I saw it, Brown. Oh, it's a beautiful neck scarf, sir. Such fine, soft wool. Yes. I was um, to remind you to wear it, sir. Cold morning. Yes, yes, yes. All right. I'll, uh, I'll consider it. Come in. Ah, Captain Bush. I'll go and bring your dinner, sir. Well, well, alone at last. Look, you know you had me grinning like some absurd schoolboy up there this morning. I, I was so proud, uh, so flattered that you'd ask for me, Horatio. I scarcely... Well, come on, sit down. Our dinner will be coming any minute. Huh? I'm glad to see you, my old friend. Oh, well, let's go down to things of more importance. Hmm? Ah, look, I've been studying my so-called secret orders and these charts. We're headed for the Skagerrak, my friend. I was inclined to think so, sir. Then through the Kattegat and up the Narrows. The Danes will resist, I suppose. Can't help themselves. Napoleon's on their backs. And uh, what about the Swedes? That's just what no one seems to know. It's touch and go, apparently, with both the Swedes and Russians. We have to be prepared for anything. Kattegat Sound is only three miles wide part of the way. Mm -hmm. Sweden to port, Denmark to starboard. Yes, real skiller and Charybdis, huh? Well, Bush, the powers that be have left decisions up to us, and we are going to have to improvise. Now, once we're off Göteborg, I, I'm going to try and pick up some fresh news on Swedish doings. Well, let's hope that Bernadotte is leaning our way by then, sir. Yes, Bush. If not, we'll simply have to blast our way in somehow. <laughs> Up through the North Sea, into the Skagerrak. And scarcely a sail sighted off our bows the whole first week. Deserted waters, even in the Skagerrak off Denmark. Now and then we'd see a tiny fishing boat far off, none within hail. We had no news. We strained our eyes for some revealing sign. Had Bernadotte made up his mind by now? Were he and Russia enemies, neutrals, or, or even friends, if handled sensibly? Before sunrise, I found Bush on the quarterdeck. Well, still no news. Are we to run the gauntlet, then? We're nearing the Helsingborg Narrows. I wonder, Bush, how many guns are on that Swedish shore. A multitude, sir, you may be sure. The charts show a good dozen forts. Shouldn't we send a boat in, sir? Find out how Sweden stands? Well, last night I thought so, Bush. It has its logic, I admit. On the other hand, a, a boat would surely advertise our presence. But, sir, if both sides of the Kattegat are hostile... Well, we could dash in the moment there is light enough to see the channel, surprise them, and, and perhaps get through, even if Sweden does resist. Mm, yes, sir, but uh, then if Sweden has joined Bonaparte, won't we be bottled up inside the Baltic? Well, the Baltic is a sizable sea, Bush. I suspect we could maintain ourselves a while. Yes. Still almost an hour till dawn... That gives us time to clear our decks. Yes. I think we'll go in, Bush, this morning. Very good, sir. Hoist the yard arm lanterns. Signal all vessels clear for action, if you please. Aye, aye, sir. All hands to quarters. Mr. Adams, clear for action. Pass the word. All ships to clear for action. Aye, aye, sir. All ships to clear for action. <laughs> An hour had passed. We came into the narrow channel just as the dawn broke in a dour grey mist. To starboard, hostile Denmark. To port, the riddle, Sweden. Was she our enemy? Well, we'd soon know at all events. Are the guns run out, Captain Bush? Aye, aye, sir. And the fire pumps manned on every ship. Here's for it, then. Uh, what signal for hoisting to our other ship, sir? The signal is, proceed to leeward in battle order. Lotus shall lead. 
Lotus, shall we lead, sir, did you say? I did. But, but, uh, <laughs> we'll bring up the rear bush, naturally. <laughs> Your face. <laughs> I know, I know. It's disappointing not to lead, but we are the shepherd of this little flock. We're the best built. The lead ships might get through before those shore gunners wake up. Hmm? They're awake already, hmm? Which shore fired that? The Danes. They've seen us, sir. Yes, there's the drift of smoke to starboard, see? Batteries firing to starboard, Captain Bush. Yes, Mr. Adams, so I gather. By the way, did you know that those low cliffs are Elsinore, where Hamlet walked? I beg your pardon, sir. Yeah, never mind, never mind. We've no time now for literary small talk, have we? Signal to Lotus, Mr. Bush. Return the fire to starboard. We'll keep exact station the star of the harbour, if you please. I say, Lotus and Clam are giving back as good as they're getting, huh? They are, they are. Bush, Bush, this channel's full of shoals. I remember that from years ago. I remember too, sir. I've put leadsmen in the chains. They'll sing out when we're reaching shallow water. Good, good, good. The sloops and the three others don't draw as much as we do. Well, let me compliment you, Bush. You've thought of everything. Well, Brown? Your neck scarf, sir. Oh, nonsense. In the midst of an action, how dare you come up here? It's and... very cold this early in the morning. Begging your pardon, sir. I had my orders. You'll recall. Oh, get below, Brown. All, all right, all right. Give me the scarf. Yes, the air is a bit chilly. With Elsinore abaft, the channel widened, and we were out of range from shore. There'd be about an hour, I reckon, before we reached the further narrows, a longer gauntlet to be run. And at its end, two Danish islands, Saltholm and Amagan. We had to pass between these, close to both. Full daylight now, they'd see us coming. We could no longer profit by surprise. But anyhow, all hands ate breakfast and relaxed and waited, as I knew, for the real test. An infernal din of guns broke out as we approached the channel. Well, well, our starboard guns can speak together after all. Well done. I wasn't too sure about that at Elsinore. A little ragged. So far, the Swedish guns had all stayed silent. And as if to make up for that, though, the Danes were throwing in everything they had at us. Salt home and wider waters seemed a very long way off. I found myself walking up and down. Well, that wouldn't do. Indifference is expected from a Commodore. So I stood still and looked about me casually. By the deep six and a half six! Six fathoms are quite ample, aren't they, Bush, with the tide making? I think so, sir. I wouldn't care to risk less than five, though, just now. By the mark six! Put another leadsman on the port chains quickly, Adams. Look, Bush, Salt home and Amager at last. You see them reeling up ahead there? Both bristling, I'll be bound. Yes, smoke bursting from Amager already. This tells the story, doesn't it? Salt home is where they keep their powder stored. And a half five! And a half five, sir! Shaving a shoal, that's certain. I hope... Bush, the Harvey's hit. The Harvey's hit. Our men must gone. Shrouds are trailing. Quarterless five. Quarterless five. We're nearing those shoals, too. Harvey's quite helpless, eh? Oh, yes, 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 I see. Oh, damnable luck, Bush. We'll be alongside her in a moment. Back the main tops. Stand by with the heaving lines there. Help me. Give me that speaking trumpet, huh? Aboard the Harvey there. Can you hear me? Aye, aye, sir. I'm Lieutenant Smith, sir. Are anyone injured, Mr. Smith? Lieutenant Mound, sir, knocked unconscious. And two men killed when the shell struck. We'll bring Mr. Mound aboard here, then. Send men down for him, Captain Bush. Cut that wreckage away smartly and stand by to receive our lines. What's that? Are we hit, too? Our uh, mizzen top mask gone. Hoy the mark, hoy! By the mark, hoy! Ah, that's better. We must be bearing off the shoals. Near hit that one. The reaching is much too easily from Salt Home. I don't like it. Yes, sir. Short range. Uh, now that we're delayed... Now, look here. Those powder stores of theirs. Let's make a try for those. They, they might lie just beyond the highest fort. It seems fairly logical. Why not? But, sir, how do we know where to... Aye, aye, sir. Certainly. Mr. Adams, have starboard batteries raise sights. Try for a hit beyond that big red fort. Say by, uh, by, uh... Um, Fifteen yards. By 15 yards. 
Uh, pass the wire to Adams instantly. Starboard battery is prepared to fire. Target at 15 yards past the right port. 15 yards past the right port. Wild idea, I suppose, Bush, but we simply can't sit here till the harbour is in tow. It's too much like duck hunting with the nuns such as the duck. Ready? Fire! No good, sir. And the Harvey's got us trapped under those guns. They'll sink her any minute, and us with her. Let's try another salvo, Bush. Twenty yards beyond the port this time. Pass the word, Adams. Twenty yards. Target at twenty yards past the same port. Ready? Fire! Awesome, sir. That blast. I think, why, yes, it's even taken the fort with it. That fort and all its guns. At least they're singularly silent. I still don't quite believe my eyes. A lucky guess in place of sound ballistics, eh? <laughs> that makes no sense. Well, <clears throat> yeah, to business now. Where's my trumpet? Oh. Mr. Smith! Mr. Smith! Have you our lines? Are they secure? You ready to get out of here? Aye, aye, sir. One more moment, sir. Well, the cable's coming over now. We'll take you out Stan first, understand? Stand by for the cable, men. Don first, Dickie. <laughs> Well, sir, not a bad afternoon. Harvey's in tow. Lotus took one poor hit. We have a hole or two in our own shroud, but no ships lost. I shan't forget what we did to those powder stores on Salt Hole. Mm, yes, uh, that was a satisfactory moment. There's been no firing for a good ten minutes. They can't quite reach us anymore. We'll sail round Falsterbo, clear of all batteries, I think. I'm a bit tired. Um, Adams, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Adams, has Mr. Mound been brought up yet? Yes, sir. He's aft. Unconscious now. The sergeant's with him. I want to see him. Concussion and bad shoulder wound. A little bit of blood about the face and throat. Take it easy. Well, here you are, Mound. Surgeon taking care of you all right? Uh, yes. Thank you, sir. I'm quite all right. We're taking him below to sick bay in a moment. I'm proud of all my young officers today, Mound. They're not too uncomfortable, I hope. Did all of us get through, sir? All our ships? That we did, Mound. What pleases me... Those Danish guns raked us with all they had, but not one shell from Sweden's coast. They're, they're not against us yet, at any rate. He's shivering, Adams. It's cold this afternoon. Here, put this scarf round his neck and shoulders. I don't need it. But, sir, he, he's bleeding on your scarf. Oh, come on, take it. <clears throat> oh, well, then I'll do it myself. Yeah. Is that better, man? Ah, uh, yes, sir. Wonderful. Thank you. We hailed a fishing boat a few minutes ago, Mound. Found out the Blanche Fleur passed through the Baltic yesterday. Big French corvette with at least 20 guns. She must be just ahead of us. Well, you'll have to get well quickly, Mound. Won't want to miss the fun, will you? Thank you, Wiggins. Why, it's... Why, why, it's from... I thought so, m'lady. I'm very pleased for you. My dearest wife, I found a means of sending this brief note to you by way of Sweden. And I want you to know that all is well with us here in the Baltic. On the whole, we've had a remarkably quiet time. Few slightly sticky moments getting in. The Danes on shore showed a bit of ill temper, but there's very little to report that isn't merely ship's routine. Oh, my dear. My dear, you're such a bare-faced liar, I'm sure. But I do love you very much. It is my hope that somehow I shall soon receive letters from England and know thereby that you are well and happy. I'm sure you will like hearing that Brown takes magnificent care of me passes over me far too much. He seems to think that in doing so, he's following someone's orders. I can't think who. <laughs> the weather is surprisingly fine. You'll be glad to know that it's quite warm. I haven't even needed the handsome scarf you needed lately. But rest assured, 
But all goes well with me. I send you my whole, my heartfelt love, my dear Horatio. Horatio Hornblower, starring Michael Redgrave, is based on the novels by C.S. Forrester. The radio script was written by Philo Higley. Music composed and conducted by Sidney Torch. Produced by Harry Allen Towers.